Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you've all been doing well and staying safe. Uh, I'm going to start off today with just a story. So, so I want to start off today by telling you a story about Louis Gregory. Uh, Mr. Gregory was one of the first African-American Baha'is in the U.S., and this story is about one of his interactions with Abdul Baha, who is the son of Baha'u'llah, who is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. So during the visit of Abdul Baha in the United States in 1912, um, a luncheon was held in his honor, and it was given in Washington, D.C., by Mirza Ali Kuli Khan and Madame Khan, who were both Baha'is. Khan was at that time the charge de affairs of the Persian legation in the capital city. And many notable people were invited, some of whom were members of the official and social life of DC, as well as a few Baha'is. Um, just an hour before the luncheon, Abdul Baha sent word to Louis Gregory um, so that he might come to him for the promised conference. So Louis arrived at the appointed time, and the conference went on and on, and Abdul Baha seemed to want to prolong it. Um, when the luncheon was announced, Abdul Baha led the way, and everyone followed him to the dining room, except Louis. Uh, all were seated when suddenly Abdul Baha stood up, looked around, and then said to Mirza Khan, where is Mr. Gregory? Bring Mr. Gregory. There was nothing for Mirza Khan to do but to find Mr. Gregory, who fortunately had not left the house yet, but he was quietly waiting for a chance to do so. Finally, Mr. Gregory came into the room with Mirza Khan, and Abdul Baha, who was really the host, as he was wherever he was, he had by this time rearranged the place setting and made room for Mr. Gregory, giving him the seat of honor at his right. He stated that he was very pleased to have Mr. Gregory there, and then in the most natural way, as if nothing unusual had happened, proceeded to give a talk on the oneness of mankind. So I want to um, tell you a little bit more about Louis Gregory's life. Mr. Gregory was born in Charleston, South Carolina on June 6, 1874, less than a decade after his parents were free from slavery. Um, he belonged to the first generation of African Americans in the South to have a legal right to education. He attended state-run primary schools and later studied at private institutions established by white missionaries. He received a secondary education at Avery Normal Institute, which was the first high school for African Americans in Charleston to provide a college prep curriculum. He graduated in June 1891, shortly before his mother's death. Then he attended Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he earned a bachelor's degree in 1896. Then after teaching for a few years at Avery, he decided to become a lawyer. Um, but his choice of a career required him to leave the South because the region offered African-Americans no opportunities to study law. Um, and in that time, which was the post reconstruction period, there was no possibility of employment in the legal field. So then in 1899, he enrolled in the School of Law at Howard University in DC. And he was one of 20 graduates, all male in 1902. And he gave the commencement address, which was entitled the growth of peace laws, in which he focused on disarmament and international peace initiatives. He was admitted to the bar of, of DC in October 1902, and then the bar of the United States Supreme Court in March 1907. So Gregory practiced law in DC for 15 years, and for a while he was in partnership with another young Howard graduate, James A. Cobb, who later became assistant US attorney in DC and a judge of the DC uh, Municipal Court. Both men were considered rising stars in Washington's black community. Beginning in 1904, Gregory then worked for a decade as a clerk at the United States Treasury Department, and he was promoted several times before he decided to return to full-time private practice. Um, disillusioned by the mistreatment of African Americans in the post-Reconstruction period, Gregory felt compelled to protest racial segregation and the infringement of civil rights. His ideas, as he later described them, were radical. And he was committed to a program of fiery agitation. Um, even though his mother and grandmother had been deeply religious, religion was no longer of any interest to him. He had been seeking, as he recalled later, but not finding the truth he had given up. He first heard about the Baha'i faith actually from a Treasury Department coworker who was a white Southerner. And even though he wasn't interested in the religion for himself, he thought Gregory would be. But Gregory had no inclination to attend a religious meeting. But finally, in late 1907, he agreed. Uh, Pauline Hannon, who was also a white Southerner, welcomed him to the meeting with unusual warmth, telling him what he was about to hear would make possible a work that would bless humanity. The talk by Lua Getzinger, who was one of the first Western Baha'is, provided him a brief but vivid historical account of the religions of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, who was a prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. 
So Gregory was, you know, really shocked and his expectations were defied and he was interested and he accepted Pauline Hannon's invitation to study more about the religion. So then Pauline and her husband, Joseph, became his teachers and close friends. And for the next year and a half, he attended meetings in their home and he was really impressed by their freedom from racial prejudice. He was attracted by their beliefs, but he was still held back by his agnosticism. But finally, as he later recalled, the Hannons pierced his mental veils by teaching him how to pray. So Gregory became a Baha'i in June 1909. It comes to me, he wrote to the Hannons a month later, that I have never taken occasion to thank you specifically for all your kindness and patience, which finally culminated in my acceptance of the great truths of the Baha'i revelation. It has given me an entirely new conception of Christianity and of all religion, and with it, my whole nature seems changed for the better. It is a sane and practical religion, which meets all the varying needs of life, and I hope I shall ever regard it as a priceless possession. So Gregory believed that in embracing this new faith, he wasn't setting aside his commitment to racial equality, and he wasn't distancing himself from those who were working for change, but instead he was refocusing himself and placing his concerns within a wider context, which was the establishment of a world order um, encompassing all people, and which was founded on faith um, in a supreme being and this vision for humanity. So one of Louis Gregory's first actions as a Baha'i actually was to confront which, what was the de facto segregation in the Washington DC Baha'i community. Um, you know, rather than being disillusioned by the disparity between Baha'is proclaimed beliefs and their actions, which largely reflected the customary social practices of that time, he became an agent of change. So in early 1911, um, Gregory became the first African-American Baha'i to have the privilege of pilgrimage by the express invitation of Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah. Um, Gregory traveled to Egypt where Abdul Baha was residing and then he visited the Baha'i holy places in where is now the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel. Um, this pilgrimage had this deep spiritual impact on Gregory, but it also gave Abdul Baha time to stress to him the vital importance of bringing black and white Americans together. Abdul Baha said many wonderful things during my brief contact with him in Egypt, which lasted less than a fortnight, Gregory later recalled, but more than anything, his discourse was about the American race problem. When Gregory asked Abdul Baha for his guidance, Abdul Baha reiterated the wish that he had expressed in his first letter to Gregory, urging him to work for unity and humanity between the races. So then, in further defiance of convention, Abdul Baha encouraged the marriage of Gregory and a white Englishwoman that you can see here, a Baha'i, Louisa Matthew. Um, her pilgrimage in 1911 had coincided with Gregory's, and so they had briefly met and become friends. Um, and so even though Abdul Baha had brought up the topic of intermarriage during their visit, um, he had told Gregory, if you have any influence to get the races to intermarry, it will be very valuable. But they said they only thought of each other as friends. But then when they met again in America, Abdul Baha urged them to reconsider their relationship in a new light. Only then did the potential attachment he had sensed between them blossom into love. They were married in a quiet ceremony in New York City on September 27th, 1912, and they became the first interracial Baha'i couple at a time when inter interracial marriage in the United States defied popular scientific theories about the harmful effects of race mixing. And actually in much of the nation, it was still a criminal offense. So Abdul Baha described the Gregories as an introduction to the accomplishment of fellowship between the races. Even though the couple never had children of their own, they enriched the lives of many young people. And over the years, they became a particular source of strength to a growing number, number of interracially married couples among American Baha'is. So Gregory worked in three areas I wanna highlight that were very important to promote the oneness of humankind. First, he devoted himself to teaching the Baha'i faith, particularly among African Americans. His efforts in DC immediately attracted the interest of a number of professionals and intellectuals, and the need to accommodate you know, these gatherings spurred the Washington Baha'is to reconsider their practices that had been based on racial prejudice and segregation and to begin the long process of rooting out these prejudices. Even though it was you know, many years before the community overcame these overt racial barriers, Louis Gregory's activities as a new Baha'i led to the holding of some integrated meetings, which paved the way for many interracial gatherings during Abdul Baha's visit. And the second field of his activity was Baha'i administration. Um, Gregory was first elected in February 1911 to fill a vacancy on the working committee, which was the embryonic Baha'i administrative body in DC. 
And then in 1912, during the National Baha'i Convention attended by Abdul Baha, Gregory was elected to the executive board of Baha'i Temple Unity, which was the governing body in North America at the time. So Gregory was so effective as an administrator that this kept him at the forefront um, for more than three decades. He was one of the few African Americans elected to national leadership in any interracial organization in the first half of the 20th century. And he served on the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the US for 14 years. Several times he received the highest or second highest number of votes. He filled a various number of roles such as recording secretary, which he held for six years, and he actually helped to draft the bylaws of the National Spiritual Assembly of the US, which later actually became a model for NSAs all over the world. Um, so then the third field of his contributions was the promotion of race unity. Both Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi had repeatedly called the attention of the American Baha'is to the importance of confronting racial prejudice, which Shoghi Effendi described as America's most vital and challenging issue. Gregory largely led the community's response. He was guided by Abdul Baha's instruction to work for harmony between the races. And he learned many valuable lessons while tackling the challenges he saw in DC. So in the North, there were a lot of conferences and other activities which were either sponsored or co-sponsored by the Baha'is. And this resulted in a significant public role for the religion in the fields of race relations and civil rights. And these events provided a platform for the exchange of views by a lot of leaders, both Baha'is and not Baha'is, among them W.E.B. Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, William Stanley Braithwaite, Franz Boas, and some distinguished Baha'is such as Elaine Locke, Dorothy Baker, Matthew Bullock, and so on. So Gregory either served as publicist or organizer behind the scenes, and sometimes he actually assumed the role of chairperson or speaker. Then in the South, Gregory often attempted to overcome racial barriers. He spoke to a lot of racially mixed audiences on a number of occasions, and sometimes to white groups, including um, one time he shared the platform with a big group of the KKK. And just by associating with white Baha'is, especially women, he, he risked arrest or even lynching, but he was undeterred. One time he was visiting Miami and he and two white women from the North had arranged this 21 person um, meeting. And at the end of his stay, the three of them had just taken off for a little sightseeing and a picnic on a beach that happened to be in the white section of the town. Afterward, a friend asked Gregory whether he realized that all the African Americans were praying for him because not being from the area, he obviously failed to realize how dangerous it was to be seen with white women. Gregory replied that he was born and raised in the South and he knew its customs but he found his protection in God. And he said, if he does not hold me, I am unsafe anywhere. So many of Louis Gregory's white contemporaries really recognize him as a spiritual giant at a time when this kind of recognition by white people was really unheard of. People called him a, short, a source of shimmering radiance that was so remarkable that seemed to be part of him. Um, another Baha'i who Gregory had traveled with in the South recalled, I never saw him show anger, impatience, or resentment. Instead, when met by hostility, Gregory seemed to search his innermost being and beyond for a solution to a change in the relationship. Martha Root, who was the outstanding international Baha'i teacher in the faith's first century, observed, I always feel he is one of the greatest disciples of this new day. And Shoghi Effendi also had a lot of praise to give for him. Shoghi Effendi was the grandson of Abdul Baha. And at that time, he was leading the faith administratively. And Shoghi Effendi often wrote letters to Louis Gregory on the themes of his spiritual distinction. At the midpoint of Gregory's life, Shoghi Effendi observed, I feel impelled to reaffirm my deep sense of indebtedness to you for your magnificent work in the service of the faith of Baha'u'llah. No words of mine can pay adequate tribute to the spirit that glows within your breast or to the determination that fires your soul in your unique and highly meritorious endeavors. You have attained spiritual heights that few indeed can claim to have scaled. You have displayed a spirit that few, if any, can equal. And Shoghi Effendi would later go on to tell Gregory that his letters to Shoghi Effendi were a huge source of inspiration and comfort. Um, Shoghi Effendi said, I'm always relieved by your letters from the burden of care and responsibility which often oppresses me. You hardly realize what a help you are to me in my arduous work. So <clears throat> although he was very active and involved up until the end of his life, he died suddenly at home on 
July 30th, 1951, and he was buried in Elliott, Maine. So after his death, Shoghi Effendi conferred on Gregory the rank of Hand of the Cause of God, which was a very you know, high distinction that was given to very select Baha'is of that time to help lead the faith's efforts. And he was the eighth person and the fourth Westerner to be named so. Um, after he died, Shoghi Effendi cabled the Baha'is of the United States, and he said, profoundly deplore grievous loss of dearly beloved, noble-minded, golden-hearted Louis Gregory, keenly feel loss of one so loved, admired, and trusted by Abdu'l-Bahá, deserves rank of first hand of the cause of his race. So in the U.S. and around the world, Louis Gregory has been recognized for his achievements. His old friend and law, uh, former law partner, Judge James Cobb, paid tribute to him as one of those who enriched the life of America. And Baha'is have named many institutions around the world in his honor, among them several schools in Africa and also the Lewis Gregory Cottage, which is now at Greenacre, which is a Baha'i school in Elliott, Maine. And actually in 2003, his boyhood home in Charleston was dedicated as the first museum in the city to honor a particular individual and the first Baha'i-owned museum in the United States. So let me just stop sharing that. So, So the reason that I started off with this story is because it gives us so much hope and it stands in stark contrast to the brutalities and horror that we've been witnessing recently. And I hope it can guide us and give us, you know, some relief and some hope as we try to navigate this really sad reality we find ourselves in. And that reality is that racism is still alive and well. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I honestly felt a bit unqualified and out of place you know, I'm not an expert on racial issues in the US. I'm not out there right now on the front lines protesting. I'm not black. I haven't actually felt the firsthand experiences of racial discrimination. But I realized that that's kind of the point. First of all, we don't need to be perfectly knowledgeable before we speak out. We don't need to have all the answers or even pretend to. And also the onus to speak out against racism should not be on the black community. I think that's been the problem for so long non-black silence or inaction against injustice. So the responsibility of speaking out against racism needs to be on non-black people because it is we that have created the problem in the first place, or at least we continue to benefit from it and we allow it to perpetrate. So on February 23rd, we all saw Ahmaud Arbery, an unarmed 25 year old black man, fatally shot while jogging by two white residents who were armed and driving a pickup truck. And the event was recorded on video, thankfully, by a third man, William Bryan, who was following Arbery in a second vehicle. And then actually a few days ago on June 4th, additional evidence came forth that um, Travis McMichael, one of the shooters, had said the N-word while standing over Arbery's body. And then it was actually only after the video went viral, 74 days later, that the McMichaels were actually arrested. And many people have pointed out that they weren't arrested because the police and authorities saw the video. It was because we, the public, had seen the video. Then on March 13th, uh, Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old black woman, was fatally shot by Louisville Metro Police Department officers. Officers had entered her apartment with no announcement because they had a no-knock warrant. And they were looking for drugs um, that apparently her boyfriend had, which never ended up actually being there but gunfire was exchanged and she was shot eight times and pronounced dead at the scene. And then recently on May 25th, we, we all witnessed the killing of George Floyd, 46 year old black man, where Derek Chauvin, who was a white police officer, knelt on his neck for over eight minutes while he was arrested, handcuffed, face down on the street. And he had been arrested on suspicion of a counterfeit $20 bill. And Chauvin continued to place his knee on Floyd's neck, even though Floyd repeatedly said, I can't breathe. He was calling out mama and please. There are far too many other black killings to even mention and do justice to here, but the killing of George Floyd has set off a series of protests and demonstrations across the US and now internationally. People are sick and tired of acts of violence, hatred and racism against black people. And even beyond that, people are outraged that the police the very people who are charged to protect and serve the American people are largely the ones inflicting this racially driven brutality against black lives. I've heard some people say that they're surprised or shocked to hear of these acts of violence and racism in the year 2020. 
I mean, I agree that these actions are deplorable, sickening, vile, but to call them surprising indicates that we're somewhat naive or unaware of their prevalence. These problems are not new to the Black community. They have been feeling and experiencing them day in and day out, even though we haven't seen them on video. And only now, thankfully, with cell phone video technology, we actually have direct evidence of the very thing the Black community has been telling us for decades and centuries. And even with the video evidence, we still can't rely on proper authorities to condemn and punish these acts of, of racism. Shoghi Effendi, who is the guardian of the Baha'i faith, he wrote to the American Baha'i community in 1938, as to racial prejudice, the corrosion of which for well nigh a century has bitten into the fiber and attacked the whole social structure of American society, it should be regarded as constituting the most vital and challenging issue confronting the Baha'i community at the present stage of its evolution. Even though these words were written over 80 years ago, we see that as a nation, we're still facing this very same issue. But really, at its core, what is racism? Where does it actually stem from? Well, at a fundamental level, it's the erroneous and damaging belief that there is any real difference between human beings at an intrinsic level. It's a shunning of the belief of unity and oneness of humankind. And it's honestly a desperate and futile attempt to raise up one category of individuals over another based on something as superficial as the level of pigment in one's skin. In 1989, the Baha'i International Community, in its statement to the 45th session of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, asserted, just as fever is a symptom of disease in the body, racism is a symptom of disease in society. Suppressing the symptom does not cure the disease, but curing the disease eliminates the symptom. The Baha'i International Community is convinced that the disease from which society currently suffers is failure to recognize the principle of the oneness of humanity. And racism is but a symptom. If we wish to eliminate racism entirely, we must establish as the moral foundation for society, the unshakable conviction of the oneness of the human race. So these words are especially pertinent in light of the widespread protests that have now been occurring. Many of our government leaders are scrambling to try to figure out how to stop these protests. And ironically, many times they use force and they wonder how can we end the civil strife? Well, like the Baha'i International Community stated, this racism and the protests that have stemmed as a reaction against it, these are symptoms of the disease. The disease is racism and people are not going to rest until that disease is cured. And at a basic level, the way to cure this disease is by firmly establishing the unity of all people as the moral foundation of our society. Abdul Baha stated, God is the shepherd of all and we are his flock. There are not many races, there is only one race. So what does this phrase, there is only one race mean? Well, as scientific technology has advanced, geneticists have come to find that there's actually no such thing as race from a scientific standpoint. Um, a 2018 article in Scientific American said, that there is a broad scientific consensus that when it comes to genes, there's just as much diversity within racial and ethnic groups as there is across them. And the Human Genome Project has confirmed that the genomes found across the globe are 99.9% .9 identical in every person. So the very idea of different races is nonsense. And anthropologists also agree that there are no major complex behaviors that directly correlate with what might be considered human racial characteristics. There is no inherent relationship between intelligence, law-abidingness, economic practices, and race. So race is not a biological reality, not a social reality, but it's really a myth. So does the phrase, there's only one race, mean that we shouldn't see color? Because I see a lot of people saying, we just shouldn't see color, we shouldn't, we shouldn't even see that difference. Um, but I don't think this is the case. Abdul Baha said, consider the world of created things, how varied and diverse they are in species, yet with one sole origin. All the differences that appear are those of outward form and color. This diversity of type is apparent throughout the whole of nature. Behold, a beautiful garden full of flowers, shrubs, and trees. Each flower has a different charm, a peculiar beauty, its own delicious perfume and beautiful color. The trees too, how varied are they in size and growth and foliage and what different fruits they bear. Yet all these flowers, shrubs, and trees spring from the self-same earth, the same sun shines upon them, and the same clouds give them rain. So it is with humanity. It is made up of many races, and its peoples are of different color, 
but they all come from the same God and all are servants to him. The diversity in the human family should be the cause of love and harmony, as it is in music, where many different notes blend together in the making of a perfect chord. If you meet those of different race and color from yourself, do not mistrust them and withdraw into your shell of conventionality, but rather be glad and show them kindness. Think of them as different colored roses growing in the beautiful garden of humanity and rejoice to be among them. Baha'u'llah has drawn the circle of unity. He has made a design for the uniting of all the peoples and for the gathering of them all under the shelter of the tent of universal unity. This is the work of the divine bounty. And we must all strive with heart and soul until we have the reality of unity in our midst. And as we work, so will strength be given unto us. Leave all thought of self and strive only to be obedient and submissive to the will of God. In this way only shall we become citizens of the kingdom of God and attain unto life everlasting. So I wanna share another story about Abdul Baha during his stay in New York, which illustrates the fact that he wasn't colorblind, but rather he found racial differences a thing of beauty. So um, Abdul Baha in New York City, he was on his way to speak to several hundred men at the Bowery Mission, and he was accompanied by a group of Persian and American friends. And not unnaturally, a group of boys was suddenly intrigued by the sight of this group of Persians with their flowing robes and turbans, and so they started to follow them. But the, soon the boys became noisy and difficult to control. And a lady in Abdul Baha's party was highly embarrassed and she went and she talked to the boys and she tried to explain to them who Abdul Baha was. And she invited them, she didn't think they're actually gonna take her up on her invitation, but she invited them to her home the following Sunday and said, if you want to see Abdul Baha, you know, we can make arrangements for that. So then on Sunday, some 20 or 30 of them appeared on her doorstep and they were little scruffy, but it seemed that they had kind of tidied up for the occasion nonetheless. And Abdul Baha came to the door and he greeted each boy with a hand clasp or an arm around the shoulder with warm smiles and boyish laughter. And his happiest welcome seemed to be directed to the 13 year old boy near the end of the line. He had the deepest color skin and he didn't seem too sure he'd be welcome. But Abdul Baha's face lit up and in a loud voice that everyone could hear, he exclaimed, here is a black rose. The boy's face was just shining with happiness and love and silence fell across the room as the boys looked at their companion with a new awareness. Master didn't stop at that though. He had this big box of five pound chocolate that he asked to be brought and he gave a handful to each boy. But finally, with only a few left in the box, he found the, the darkest colored chocolate and he walked over to the boy and he placed it next to his cheek. And he was just radiant as he lovingly put his arm around the boy's shoulders and with a humorous glance, he glanced around the room and didn't say anything else. So as we see these injustices taking place today, it's really easy for us to feel helpless or out of control. You know, we wonder how can we even begin to help dismantle this huge centuries long system of racism. I always am reminded of this quote by Shoghi Effendi. <clears throat> he says, we cannot segregate the human heart from the environment outside us and say that once one of these is reformed, everything will be improved. Man is organic with the world. His inner life molds the environment and is itself also deeply affected by it. The one acts upon the other and every abiding change in the life of man is the result of these mutual reactions. So I think this is, this is really true. In order to create long lasting change, we need both individual and societal change simultaneously. At the individual level, we need to emphasize the importance of spiritual education, especially for children, because we know that those are the formative years where someone's identity and belief system gets shaped. And in order to do that, honestly, we need to develop true friendship with those from other races and ethnicities. It reminds me of uh, this story about Abdul Baha. He was living in a Paris hotel for a while and among those who used to come to see him was this um, poor black man. He wasn't a Baha'i, but he loved Abdul Baha very much. One day when the man came, someone told him that management didn't like to have him there, a poor black man, because it wasn't consistent with the standards of the hotel. So the poor man went away. But when Abdu'l-Baha learned of this, he sent for the man responsible. And he said, you have to find my friend. He was not happy that he was turned away. <clears throat> Abdu'l-Baha said, I did not come to see expensive hotels or furnishings, but to meet my friends. I did not come to Paris to conform to the customs of Paris, <clears throat> 
but to establish the standard of Baha'u'llah. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I really urge all of us, even long after these protests are over and these, this media coverage subsides, to really try to form genuine loving friendships from people who look different from us, to encourage our children to do so, to encourage our family, our coworkers, our friends, because that's really the way we can learn and grow with each other. And I urge us to really speak out and have those difficult conversations, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's with someone of your own family, who has, you know, unfortunately still racist beliefs. And we need to stand up for it, even in these moments when no one's watching us and no one's, it's not on social media, no one's congratulating us, no one's patting us on the back. It needs to be done in these small micro ways on a daily basis. You know, what I find interesting is that Baha'u'llah actually used to refer to black people as the pupil of the eye. Abdul Baha explained that <clears throat> Baha'u'llah once compared black people to the pupil of the eye surrounded by the white, and in this black pupil is seen the reflection of that which is before it, and through it, the light of the spirit shineth forth. So if we know a little bit about how the eye works, the pupil is actually how the light gets transmitted into the eye. And I also love this metaphor because Baha'u'llah is basically saying that the pupil is essential for light, and without the pupil, someone's blind. So humanity needs this light, and only black people can provide it. So we know that individual change is one half of the puzzle, but the other half is institutional and societal change. Because even with individual transformation, there are certain structural changes that need to take place in order to systematize this transformation and also provide people with legal rights and remedies. For example, many people, I don't know if you've heard, have started to learn about the concept of qualified immunity for police officers. So basically qualified immunity is a legal doctrine that makes it pretty much impossible to sue police officers for abuse, excessive force and misconduct. Qualified immunity makes it so that victims can't win against cops unless they find a prior case almost exactly like theirs. So just a couple examples. Um, this past November, the Sixth Circuit US Court of Appeals held that Tennessee cops who allowed their police dog to bite a surrendered suspect did not violate clearly established law. There, the victim cited a case where the same court earlier held that it was unconstitutional for officers to put their dog on a suspect who had surrendered by lying on the ground with his hands to the side. But that was not sufficient, the court reasoned, because the victim here had not surrendered by lying down. He had surrendered by sitting on the ground and raising his hands. And then in February this year, the Fifth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals held that a Texas prison guard who had pepper sprayed an inmate in his locked cell admittedly for no reason, he did not violate clearly established law because a similar cited case involved guards who had hit and tased inmates for no reason, not pepper sprayed them for no reason. So in this, both of these cases, the officers were granted qualified immunity. And it's actually interesting looking into this doctrine. It was first invoked in a 1967 Supreme Court case, Pearson versus Ray, and it was invoked to shield white police officers from a lawsuit they had faced for enforcing segregation. They had actually arrested a group of black clergymen who were peacefully protesting by sitting in a whites only waiting room in a Mississippi bus station. And today this doctrine continues to be used to protect officers who engage in horrific acts of abuse, often towards people of color. And later cases just kept expanding the scope of qualified immunity and further eroded police accountability. So qualified immunity, ending it, is one of the necessary steps towards reducing police violence and increasing accountability. And even though this seems like it's outside of our realm of influence, there are ways we can get involved. First of all, we can just help by spreading awareness of this issue to people we know. And also, currently, legislation is being proposed in both the House and the Senate that would help end or limit qualified immunity. And we can contact our representatives and voice our support and demand that they support this. But there's also so much other structural change that needs to take place. For example, there needs to be better training for police officers, especially with uh, issues of race. There needs to be better education in our public schools, showing how racism still operates today. It's not something that happened centuries ago. It's still operating today. And even though we feel like maybe we can't personally contribute to each of these endeavors, we all have our own sphere of influence, whether it's in our work, our family life, our friend life, there's always a way we can contribute. And actually, one of the most important ways we can contribute is by voting, especially at the local level, which is where people largely ignore it. But when we vote for judges, mayors, city officers, councilmen, and so on, 
these are the people who are actually shape most of these practices that affect our local communities. So this is one way we can directly get involved. Almost 60 years ago, in his letter from a Birmingham jail to his fellow clergymen, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So honestly, today what gives me hope is that our nation, our world is slowly but surely waking up to this reality. I mean, first we had the pandemic, which has really given us a sense of how interconnected and interdependent we are as a world. And then now with these instances of injustice coming to light, the people who are just content to be in their spheres of safety and complacency, they're realizing that people aren't gonna stand for the status quo anymore. And that injustice anywhere is a threat to all of us. And as Dr. King further wrote, which I think this is really relevant to today, he said, you deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I'm sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It's unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. So I think these words honestly couldn't ring truer at the moment, and we need to grapple with the root cause, like I said, instead of focusing on these outward protests, which are just a symptom. So with that, I thank all of you for your time, and I now invite you all for questions or comments so, I, so we can consider how we can start actually grappling with this issue in our daily lives. Thank you.